All right, our next presentation. Very intriguing animal, one of the most famous animals in the conservation story. You gonna tell us a lot more about this. I think I may have seen one in the wild one time. I wish I could go back and take a picture. I don't know for sure. But let's welcome Aiden Short with the California Condor. Hello, everybody. Mm -hmm. Today I'm doing my report on the California Condor. Here's his classification. The scientific name is the Gymnogips californianus. The kingdom is Anomalia, the phylum, Pagata, class, apes, order, Falconiforms, fam family, Cathartidae, and that includes all of the New World vultures, which is five vultures and two condors. Its genus is the Gymnogips, and the species is the Californianus. Next slide, please. Its, most, its closest relative is the Andean condor. You can see it's kind of similar, but the Andean condor has this thing up here. Um, it's slightly smaller than the California condor in length, but it has a larger wingspan. And, but that said, the California condor is the largest flying bird. Which goes up there. Next slide. Yep, it's the largest flying bird in America. It's three and a half to four and a half feet long. Weighs about 18 to 25 pounds and has a wingspan of 9 to 10 feet. The males and females, there's just a picture of them, they look exactly alike. There is no difference. To find the gender of them, they use genetic. So, like, DNA stuff. Next slide, please. The adults have red and orange and completely bald heads. The juveniles have a black head that's bald as well. The heads, um, this head will change to that head when the juveniles reach um, four to six years of age. And the heads are bald for eating animals because it keeps them, they have a better hygiene because the, they eat dead animals, it doesn't get all stuck in their feathers and stuff. And the beaks are long and sharp for piercing hides of cattle and stuff like that for them to eat. The feathers are mostly black, but then they have this white lining under it, as you can see. The juveniles have the same black plumage, but it doesn't have as much white lining. They have a little bit. As you can see in these pictures, and there's more pictures of head, they have tags. It's because, I'll talk about it later, but um, they're releasing them back into the wild. They were down to almost, they were extinct in the wild at one point, and now they're being released back into the wild, and they're marking them so they can see. Next slide, please. Here's its historic range. At one time, it used to go... All the way up, it used to actually go into British Columbia up in Canada, all the way down, actually down to Baja, New Mexico. And it's thought that one day, the, uh, at one time, they used to go all the way up, all the way across southern, southern America and then all the way into the East Coast. But by, due to climate change, it was down to, by the 1900s, it was down to just the West Coast and the Southwest. And, next slide please. Um, but now, because of the because they went extinct in the wild, now they're being released and they're here. Their main the main population of them is in central and southern California, but there's some of them in Baja, New Mexico, or Baja, sorry, Baja, California, in Mexico. Um, there's some and there's some in um, Arizona and a few in Utah. Next slide. They have a different habitat for each of the three primary needs. Scavenging, which is going around and looking for dead animals to eat. Roosting, so you can see here, there's a picture. You can kind of see them right in there. He sits in, they sit in dead trees and stuff. And nesting, right here before they lay their eggs. Next slide. The scavenging, they like oak savanna, like this, and open grassland with large, with large populations of mammals, like deer and cattle, and occasionally even eating dead horses. Or um, large to medium to large mammals they find down on the ground. Sorry. Roosting. They roost in dead trees and cliffs, and they'll come to the same place year after year. See here, there's a um, cavity in the tree. They'll go and sit there, and then they will actually um, tell younger juvenile birds where that where good nesting places are, and they'll leave them there so they can have a good nesting place as well. Sorry. Nesting. They don't make stick nests like a lot of birds, but they just nest in caves like this, cliffs, and crevices. They lay their eggs there, and they will, they will um, come back to there year after year, too, as well, to lay their eggs. 
the conservation status. According to the IUCN, it is critically endangered, but its population is increasing because of the numbers that are being reintroduced back into the wild. Uh, in 1981, its population was down to just 22 birds, and that was right before they just took them all away and they put them into a captive breeding program so that they could, so the pop, so they wouldn't go completely extinct. So the captive breeding programs brought them up to the population, and now they're being reintroduced back into the wild. There's about 210 in the wild as a resource. That was from 2012, so there could be more now. Next. For mating, the male of this will spread his wings to the female and rock back and forth and have his head arched forward and down. And then they will also follow each other in acrobatic flights to try and, and then they will get together. And then they stay together for life. They will not, they never separate unless one of the others died and they will go after a new mate. They reach sexual maturity at four to six years of age. The female lays one egg every other year because the, um, the baby will stay with them up to two years and then they want to be able to take care of that baby. The egg is usually laid between January and March. And right here, it's a pale, you can kind of see it's a pale green color sometimes more whitish, but, and they will, sometimes if the egg is lost to a predator of some sort, then they will do a process called double clutching, where they were um, a few, up to a month afterwards, they will re um, lay a replacement egg, for, so they can have a baby, so please. Parental care. The parents take turns incubating for four, 54 to 58 days before the baby hatches. The um, chick is fed regurgitated food by both parents, in a better picture of this, this isn't very good, but in a better picture you can see that they have a, um, a thing under their neck called, um, I forget what it's called, but they will store food in there and then they can regurgitate it. After about five months, the chick starts to walk from the nest. And at 10 to 12 months, he will start to fly, but he will stay with the parents and come back into his second year before it goes off and be, um, becomes completely independent and tries to find a mate after four to six years. They live about 45 years in captivity and 20, an estimated 20 in the wild, although they don't know for sure because they haven't, because of the, they had to take them in and they haven't seen how, in the wild, how long they can live in the wild. Um, the main causes for the death is lead poisoning, egg collecting. Eggs, back before it was illegal, egg collecting used to go for, eggs to go up to $300 per egg. Um, so they would shoot them and power lines that they would land on, they would get electrocuted and die. There, was, um, there were some big causes. Next slide, please. Seasonal patterns. They do not hibernate or undergo torpo, and they don't migrate. They will stay in the same place year-round, as I showed you in the distribution map earlier. They stay in the Arizona, California, northern Mexico, and a little bit of Utah. Area. Diet. Here are some pictures. So he eats medium animals to big animals. That is, I'm not sure if there's a California condor in there, but I was just trying to, I was finding an example of it. And that is probably cattle. They will eat the dead cattle. They're carrion eaters, which means they like carcasses of dead mammals. And then, but even though they are carrion eaters, they actually prefer fresh meat. So they like animals that have just been killed. They'll come down and Probably, like, if a wolf had just killed them or something like that, they'll come, well, not wolf, but if a predator had just killed an animal, then they'll come down and eat that and book a vulture. Um, the cattle carcasses and other dead large animals. And in a day, they can travel up to 150 miles in search of food. Predators. They, mainly humans, like I listed earlier, the shooting, egg collecting, lead poisoning. Lead poisoning is a big one because they... Um, hunters will shoot cattle, and then they will have the lead poisoning. They'll have the lead from the bullets. The lead, it's illegal now to have lead bullets and shoot the animals, but they would, the um, California condors would eat the lead, and then they would get lead poisoning and possibly die. So, but some birds, such as ravens and even black bears, will sneak into their nests and take their eggs away and eat the eggs. Um, so that could be a threat to them. And then here, poaching power lines, lead poisoning, almost wiped out the California condor. Like I said, it got down to only 22 birds. 
And today, even when they're being reintroduced, lead poisoning is still a problem because the California gardeners are still carrying eaters and not everyone follows the law. So, some things happen, looks like this. Human relations. This is a picture of them in the San Diego Zoo. They are, they have, that was the first place that the captive breeding program started. They were taken into captivity for the breeding program. The humans helped out to bring the population up because they were down to just 22 and in the wild. And now they're up to over 300 birds, including in captivity and the wild. And they're still being released into the wild today, more and more of them, until the population isn't critically endangered. And they are kept in zoos. Fun facts. California condors don't have vocal cords. So to communicate, they have to hiss, grunt, growl, and use their body language. They have a um, very kind of a, they have a good system of body language to communicate with other California condors and birds to communicate with them. Um, the Native Americans called it the Thunderbird because of its huge wings. They said that when it beat its gigantic wings, it would bring thunder to the skies. The babies, once they begin to try and hack to get out of the to hatch out of the um, shell. They can take up, it takes up to a week of them packing at it. To a week. To a week. Oh. Typo. Oh, yeah. Typo. typo. They can fly to altitudes of 15,000 feet, which Martin. is very high, and reach speeds of 60 miles an hour in their flying. And. Oh, what happened? Weston. They're watching. Weston. They know you're the one. Oh, I'm pretty sure it's my work side of the page. Okay, let's go to that one real quick. Let's just go fast. Just do it. Yeah. Do, 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 do. Questions for me, man. Questions for you. Nobody. Oh. Oh. Um, so when I was living in California a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. Connor was a pretty big story, as I'm sure it yeah. still is. Yeah. Um, and they were debating the hunting that you talked about. Mm -hmm. So at that point, lead bullets are illegal, and they are illegal in most states for waterfowl. Yeah. But upland hunting, like deer, um, rabbits, grouse, etc., you could still use lead. And they were trying, they were going to maybe put that law into effect, or did they? You did know? they? I think, I read somewhere that it was illegal. To, to use lead bullets for all kinds of hunting or only for, I I think I read that it was illegal. It was deer. That was, mm -hmm. It was deer that was the main problem because they would shoot deer. Sure. So I think they made it illegal for deer. Yeah. Have other states in the ranges Arizona and Utah? Do they have the same laws? Do you know? I'm not sure. I read California does. And my second question for you, uh, what do you think the chances are, since we are in their historic range, has there any, been any talk of Washington getting some or Oregon getting some? Maybe, but the problem is they're really, all New World vultures are, which is their family, they're all, they like warm weather. Mm -hmm. They stay in the mm -hmm. south where it's warm year round because they don't migrate. Mm -hmm. So here it would get really cold in the winter and they might have to, but they're not really migrators. So I think they would stay there. But it did, since it wasn't the historic range. Mm -hmm. if, oh, I thought we were in the historic range. Yeah, we were oh, like okay. we were in the historic range. But since but that was before like I think it said before an ice age. Oh, that was, before the 1900s. That yeah, okay. when it got that really was, cold, yeah. so that they had to go down to a warmer place. Okay. Any other questions? Oh. Um, so their eyes are bald because they eat these things. Because they eat like dead hair, and you know what that is, like yep. dead air. So they stick their heads, and they don't want to get, mm -hmm. like if they had feathers, it would get all over their feathers. And even though it seems like they would be kind of dirty, they're actually very clean. They like to b they bathe a lot, and if they can't find like a pond to bathe in, they will actually go to like a wet their head on a tree or grass to try and get all that off. So, any other questions? All right, give me a short one.